and number three. And we'll go through about verse 14 if we make it that far. Verse, uh, we we'll began reading in verse 1. 1 John chapter number 3. And the Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Behold, or look here. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and doeth it not yet appear what we shall be? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> Whosoever is born of, born of God doeth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now to truly expound these 14 verses, we could probably be here for about 14 months, only a month each verse, and that would still probably just end the service. But John here, he uses a word that is in all caps, behold, to look at. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us. I think we just talked about that in our testi testifying a little while ago in our praises. We really cannot fathom how much God truly loves us. We can think we know, but we've not even touched a, a, a drop in the bucket, as the old saying goes, as how much God loves us. In fact, we don't really know how much God loved us to send his son for God so loved. That's what I preached on last night there at the funeral home. So loved. The Bible doesn't say that he just loved us, which he does, but it said that he so loved us. It, it, it's, you know, extenuating. It's extraordinary. It's without measure. And if you run into one of them Johnny come lately that says, oh, I know how much the Lord loved me. He done this, this, and this. Well, yes, he might have done this, this, and this. But that friend uh, has no clue of how much God really loves us. Mm -hmm. And so we can, in our feeble human mind, kind of get a small grasp in the way we love one another. That's what a lot of this chapter is about. Um, it, it, it really disturbs me at times how we as Christians, and I, I'm going to say that collectively. We're not going to single anybody out tonight. But how we can call ourselves at times Christians, but yet we can hate our brother. Or 
we can have all against our brother or we or sister or so on and so forth. And because Jesus said, if you're up me, you can't do that. Now, David didn't say that tonight. The word of God said that. Does that mean that that person that's done us wrong, do we have to forgive them? Absolutely. Do we have to do our best to forget it? Absolutely. Do we have to be their best friend? I ain't found that nowhere in scripture yet. But I did say forgive them. But that does mean if it comes a time that we can sit down together and be respectful of one another, agree to disagree, and still forgive that person. But we as Christians can't go to Walmart, as none of us do. I mean, that's the only place we got to go around here other than this, the, our, our local Walmart down here at the Dollar General. Amen. And we see somebody coming and we thought, like, I just don't like that person. In fact, I really don't want to be around them. Well, is that being a Christian tonight? No. You say, well, preacher, I had a bad day today. Well, bless your heart. I think if we went around the room, every one of us sometime throughout the last few days, weeks, or months, have had one bad day. Amen. Amen. Brother Robert's on board tonight. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. And, 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 and we take that out on people. I've said this time and time again, and sometimes it drives my wife crazy. But believe it or not, I can tell how every one of you, man, woman, and child, when you walk in that door back there, what kind of mood you're in. I don't know if it come with an inheritable trait of my last name or what, but I've always, you can ask my wife, there ain't too many people that I've not read pretty good. She's coming to me and she said, what do you think? And I tell her what I think. And six months later, she goes, well, you just pretty, pretty close on that one, let you you come in here and you put on the show. But the Bible says that the light in the body is the eye. You can tell a whole lot about somebody by looking them in the face. Mm -hmm. And so, if we're trying to hide it from God, which we can, we're trying to hide it from our fellow brother and sister in Christ, I love you. <laughs> and then we walk away and then... then Is that good preaching? Amen. Oh, I love it. And then as we walk away, we're cutting them down and we're taking their legs out from under them. Why? Well, preacher, they stole my box of crayons in third grade. <laughs> or they jumped in front of me in the line to, to get an ice cream from the ice cream machine that don't work at McDonald's. <laughs> And then the next time we're at McDonald's, there, there they are again in, in front of us again, and they buy our lunch, and then we feel about that big. Right. You know why? Because being that way only hurts us. It never hurts nobody else. Amen. But it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons, the children of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved. Now are we the sons of God, that do not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And here comes my point from what I just said about all of that. And every man that hath this hope in him, what does he do? He purifies himself, right? How many of you like bleach? Okay, we got some clean folk in here. A little bit of bleach can purify a whole lot. <clears throat> if you got dirty water, you can literally take a, 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 a half a tablespoon or a half a teaspoon of bleach in a gallon of water. I don't care if it's out of the scummiest pond in the world. It might not look clean, but you can pour a cap full of bleach in it, shake it up, let it sit for a few minutes, and pour it out and test it, and it'll be clean. We should examine our lives in that fashion. Lord, what is it in me that needs purified? What is it in me that I need to have cleansed? What did David say? Uh, David gets a bad rap. I'm not talking about this David. I'm not talking about the David in the Bible. But maybe this David does get I don't know. But anyway. Yep, did he commit adultery? Yep. Along with millions of other people. 
Did he kill? Yep, along with many other people. But David realized his sin. And when he realized his sin, what was the first thing he done? <laughs> he didn't go down to his best friend's house. Why? Because he probably just killed him. <coughs> and he didn't go down to this neighbor's house and say, oh, what have I done? What, you know, he was told, David, you are the man. And after that, he goes and he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Purge me. Clean me. You know when I believe that we'll see revival in this country and in this commonwealth and even in this church is when we as Christians say, Lord, purge me. I know, I know, I know the people in the crowd or the pre we've all got to the Lord purge me. I know they got their problems. I know they're struggling with it. The Lord purge me. Lord, I know my wife may be going through things, my children, my grandchildren, my, my, my neighbors, the Lord purge me. You see, revival starts in an individual. It doesn't start in some great big group that's on, uh, you know, some big publicized event. It starts in the heart of the individual. And so that's how it must begin in us. The great Welsh revival it started in the heart of a man named Evan Roberts. Why? Because there were two or three little old ladies, elderly widowed ladies that began to pray for a young preacher boy that not many thought a lot of. He's only 26. In fact, it said that there was elder men of God set in the congregations day in and day out criticizing that young preacher boy. Well, they're all dead and gone and so is Evan Roberts, but I'm here to report to you tonight that God poured out his blessings on the 26-year-old preacher, not the 95-year-old. Now, can he the 95-year-old? Absolutely. But that preacher, they said, would spend three and a half hours down behind his pulpit in prayer. He'd preach for 15 minutes. That's all he would preach. And thousands upon thousands of people, every meeting would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the power of God, folks. You know what I believe? Why that happened? Because that man's heart was pure. We carry around so much strife. Uh, I, I'm a very transparent person. You want to know something about me? Just ask me. Uh, you can ask any of the leadership of this church. You got something? You just ask me. I'll tell you. I'm not. I, I'm not one of those people that try to hide stuff in clock. That's what. It, that's what we need. You know why I think God's blessing our little area? Because there's groups of men and women that can congregate together, and we don't put Brookside over, or we don't put. South Fork over, or we don't put Valley View over, or Sugar Grove. We don't put a title above us. We just assemble ourselves as Christians. Amen. <laughs> Brother Danny, and I hope Brother Jason watches this, because I love picking on him. I love picking on him and eating. I'm a fat boy, so that'll tell you something. <laughs> Brother Danny gave him a Brookside shirt. He, he, he walked into Revival one night, and he said, I need one of them Brookside shirts. Now, he passed for South Fork. Jason, I hope you listen to <laughs> And so some of y'all got some hats tonight and the rest of you get them Sunday or when I see you between now and then. And, and, and what was it last night? Preacher Cena had new hats. And this is what he said. He said, boy, I hope one of you makes it to revival at South Fork. <laughs> now, if you would have found a preacher that wore another name on his chest outside the church that he pastored 20 years ago, the world would have fell apart. And me and Brother Danny has yet, Brother Jason, to get our South Fork shirt. <laughs> Amen. And you know what that means? That we have unity among the brethren. What does Psalm 133, how pleasant and how good it is for us as God's people to dwell in unity. And the only way we can dwell in unity is laying all that on the table have our sins forgiven and purged, as John says here, that we purify ourselves and we can have the joys of the Lord. Amen. Four, verse four, whosoever commit a sin transgresseth also the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested, talking about Christ, to take away our sins. In him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him, now, hold on. This is the this is part I didn't want to get to tonight. If you take notes or you highlight in your Bible or you have a wide margin and you write stuff there, 
It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And then it goes down in verses 7 and 8, and it goes down there in verse 9. Now look what it says. Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. There is a group of people that have been running the earth ever since Jesus' day that said that we can live perfect. Hogwash. Amen. It says, he that is born of God sinneth not. This is a bit Adamic nature. This stuff here. It'll sin till the day they place it in the ground. Mm -hmm. But he that is born of God. Remember we're body, soul, and spirit. That soul and spirit is what's been born of God. And that cannot sin. I'll never forget the first revival or second revival I ever had Brother Andrew Swidman come up here and he made a comment. And I, I, I wish I could have had a picture of half of your all's faces that were here. He said, now follow me or I'm going to lose you right here. He said, you're only two-thirds saved. And everybody went, <laughs> what? And they're looking at one another. Did he really just say that we're just two-thirds saved? Well, I'm going to tell you again tonight, we're two-thirds saved. <laughs> The body's still sinful, but the soul and the spirit is made whole in Christ. And that is why when Christ shall appear, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us which are alive in the room uh, to the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, that is when we get them new bodies. What will they look like? <laughs> Better than what we got now. <laughs> They won't hurt. They won't have to have shots, Brother Robert. We won't have to go to surgery, Brother Randall. We won't have no nurses, doctors. We won't have to have none of that. It'll be new because it's been glorified by God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, then we are made completely whole in Jesus Christ. Amen. When Adam fell in the garden, Eve made a mess of us. And we've been making a mess of that mess ever since. But whosoever, in verse 9 says, whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Regeneration. I had a fellow tell my dad one time, a very good Christian man, honestly, knows that book a lot more than I do. He said there was one part he talked about. He said, I believe that we can go one 24-hour period without sin." My dad said, oh, that's, that's good that you think that. And the fellow said, well, I've not sinned today. He said, my hands have not committed nothing wrong. My feet have not took me any place that I should not have been. I've not sinned today. My dad looked at him. And he, he said, okay, that's wonderful. Have you had a bad fall? That gentleman hung his head. And he said, yes, I have. He said, I hate to tell you, brother, but you've seen it today. Amen. To think it, we might as well do it. That's right. And so we got a problem in the flesh. You say, preacher, I ain't seen today. Well, you might not it for 10 minutes till 8 on Wednesday evening. But maybe your favorite ball team is playing on television tonight. Or maybe there's some something you read later on or something and, and you get all out of sorts because your team's losing. Or somebody messages you something and you get all riled. You don't say nothing. But in here, it makes your blood boil. Guess what, friend? You just see. And there will not be one 24-hour period in my life nor yours that we don't do something that's against the law of God. But I'm thankful for grace. Amen. I woke up this morning with that thought, and I shared it this morning. I said extend grace to somebody today. 
Because long before we ever got out of bed this morning, grace was extended to us. You say, well, preacher, I was just sleeping peacefully. Yeah, but you're sleeping peacefully in a sinful vessel. That sometime throughout the day we fell short of his glory. And we needed to ask forgiveness. Everybody I hope in here has a prayer policy. I've got a lot of places I like to go and pray. I have places in my home that I like to pray. But for some odd reason, and I can't get, I, I said I was going to retire by the time I was 40. It's not looking real good, but. <laughs> I mean, a man can hope, right? If in this life only we have hope. But there's something about when I'm riding down the interstate in a dumb old truck, not a vehicle, not a car, but a noisy, rattly, diesel fuming, <coughs> smell like you've been sprayed off at the gas station, and the sun shining through the windshield, that it's like God sits in the seat beside you. You say, preacher, that, that's all right. You just let me tell you my story. And so today, he just it, it's funny how he just shows up. And, and I try to pray every morning. Sometimes I, I admit it's repetitious. But it's like when he sits in that seat beside of me. It's like the world opens up. And my heart opens up with it. And I was riding down the road today hollering gravel. And I began to thank God for his goodness in my life. I thanked him for you all. I thanked him for my wife and my children. Just thank him. You say, that's not much, preacher. It might not be to you, but if I ever need a message and it's been dry in the preacher's life, all I gotta go do is turn a key and push a button and take a trip from about exit 45, about 10 miles in either direction. And I promise you this. He'll give me something. It might only be five minutes, but he'll always give me something. Why? Because there's something about that place, and we should all find that place in our life. Maybe it's on a tractor. Maybe it's at a place at your work. Maybe it's somewhere out in the field. So, but find that place to say, God, purify me. Mm -hmm. That I might walk according to your will in my life. You know what? I don't want to walk in my life's will. I don't want to walk in your will. I don't want to walk in my will. I want to walk in his. When the Lord of heaven prayed, what did he say? Father, not my will, but thine be done. <laughs> And sometimes that will takes us through valleys and up mountains. But he always stays right with us. And so I'm thankful that the inner man cannot sin because the outside man is a mess in my life. I don't know about your yours. Um, and I'm just thankful tonight that God grants us and grace. And then it goes on, verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren and he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You ever had anybody who just walked up and said, how you doing today? Hope you're smiling. Hope you're having a good day. <clears throat> if there's anything I can do to help you, to a perfect stranger, we need to be more like that. You know what? You'll be surprised how far a smile goes. In fact, I've, I've said this multiple times, there's a, the, the second most contagious thing on planet Earth, and I'm being very serious tonight, the second most contagious thing on planet Earth is a yawn. Yeah. And you would not believe, but the very next question when I tell people that, well, what's the first? smile. Mm -hmm. It takes twice as many facial muscles to frown as it does to smile. Mm -hmm. I don't care how bad a day you've had today or me either. We have a reason to smile tonight. Mm -hmm. 
You say, well, preacher, it's bred into me to be a hateful old person and when things don't go my way. Well, get over it. Amen. In fact, if I see that you're having a bad day, it's probably a good chance that your preacher's going to throw a little punch at you. Because I don't like to see sad people. I know the Bible says there's times to cry and there's times to mourn, there's times to laugh, and there's time, all that. I realize that. But as a whole, we can be joyous Christians because of the grace that we've been shown. Amen. So next time when you're at the, at, I use this scenario often, when you're at the next four-way stop sign or stoplight, just look at the person in front of you and grin real big and they'll be like, what in God's name is wrong with them people? And look at the one to your left and, the one, and just smile at them and they'll be like, what in the world? Is the world coming to an end? <coughs> You ever walked into my Walmart? I, I walk by a few people every day. I walk past one, it was sometime this week, and I made it a point to speak to them, and you'd have thought that I had just killed their firstborn. <laughs> like, I can't believe he spoke to me. Friend, if I can't be nice to you, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. Because there's too many hateful people in this world. Amen. And we don't need to be one of them. Some of the most joyous Christians I know have suffered the most loss. Don't ever forget that. Some of the most joyous Christian people in this walk of life that we call friends, neighbors, and family have suffered the greatest loss. You know what? That book has 410 hymns in it. And most of those in there, a majority of those, is written by Fanny Crosby. She was blind. And she interviewed one time, and they said, Miss Fanny, if you could have your eyesight back today, would you want it? And she said, why no? She said, because the first face that I want to see is the one that I've written about all these years. Look it up. Fact check that one. You know what most of these hymns, if not all of them, were written about? What God had brought his people. What he brought his people. They ain't no, they ain't no in there. Well, I eat popsicles and it was 75 degrees and sunshine every day of my life. That's not in there. Now is it? You know what you know what him in there that says? Like? No. But what you do find is troubles, trials, grace, and mercy and God's love. And guess what? We've been seeing them for several hundred years now. And as far as I'm concerned, I still like an old red back camel, even though it, it ain't really red, it's kind of burgundy. Amen. I just soon have my own story to tell of where God's brought us from and where he's taken us to. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight. Father, we thank you for this little epistle, Lord, that you laid upon your disciples' life, that we could read about it, Lord, that we could learn from it, that we could, Lord, live by it. And, Father, that you would, uh, Lord, instill it in our lives. That, uh, Lord, the best is yet to come. But, Lord, while we wait, while we tarry, Lord, we can be joyous people in what you have endeavored us in, Lord, that you will allow us to endure. You will give us strength. You will give us comfort. You will give us peace. Most of all, Lord, you've granted us grace and given us your love. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior and your Son. Now go with us through the remainder of this week. Touch us, Lord. Be with us. We'll thank you. We'll praise you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Now before you go.